This doesn't look like what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't. Okay. My wife will Alright. Um, so this is pointing. Right. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. My name is Kasia and I'm the researcher at the Institute of Genetic Medicine. But I'm also a coordinator of the public engagement work, work package on CIBL. So CIBL is <laughs> Systems Biology for the Functional Validation of Genetic Determinants of Skeletal Diseases, which is a mouthful, but hopefully I will be able to explain to you what we actually do. Uh, so, what is CIBL? CIBL is a pan-European collaboration of 18 different centres, which are listed here. As you can see, there are universities as well as small companies, such as Alacris Polygene, uh, GATC and PRIM, which bring together the expertise in bone and cartilage research. So as you can see, we've got centres in the UK, but also in Germany, in Belgium, in France, Switzerland, Austria and Italy. And basically, what this project is doing is bringing in pe people who work on different skeletal diseases, both common and rare, in bone and in cartilage, to try and look at the joint as a complex system of different tissues. Uh, as uh, Drew mentioned before, Newcastle is quite an important centre for musculoskeletal research and a hub for a lot of this. And in this case, that's also a case because this entire project oh, it's not too yes. <laughs> is coordinated from Newcastle and the project coordinator is Professor Mike Briggs at the, at the Institute of Genetic Medicine here in Newcastle. And this project got funded last year, so we've got funding <coughs> till 2018. And we got money from the European Union and it's 12 million euros that have gone into this project. So what it is that we're actually trying to achieve, or we're looking at skeletal conditions, so genetic diseases of bone and cartilage, and also at aging processes. And we're using the cell models and, and the animal models that we have developed at the different universities, or we are developing under the civil project as well, as well as patient cells that we get, we're getting through from the patient cohorts that we have in different universities. And what we're looking to study is the functions of the genes that are associated, in all these conditions, associated with all these conditions. And what we also want to do is bring in this systems biology approach. So to bring in a lot of information and try to dissect the specific molecular pathways that lead to these diseases. So what we want to do as well is develop efficient and standardized methods of gathering data, which could be used in other universities as well after the civil project or to collaborate with the civil project so that we can actually facilitate the better talk between the universities and between the scientists and learn from each other. And once we've got these uh, ontologies and uh, reliable tools in place, what we're going to do is perform large-scale phenotyping of all the models that we have. So basically try and figure out what happens in all the conditions and all the different models that we currently have in our labs. And this will help us to identify and uh, validate a new portfolio of bi biomarkers, which we can then use in diagnosis of patients, and also identify potential therapeutic targets in the diseases that we work on. What we're also doing is we're trying to make all our efforts as open as possible, so we're going to integrate all the data that we generate into publicly accessible web portals, so everybody can look at them and feedback into us, into, to us as well, so we can try and look at other things that maybe we're not noticing. So it should, it's a very open and collaborative project. So, it's not listening to me. Right, so what we work on is we work on, co on common and rare uh, skeletal conditions. So common conditions, as you know, are related to aging and also injury. They're often multifactorial, so it's not only genetic predisposition that leads to this disease, it's also changes in lifestyle and environment and other modifications, which makes them sometimes difficult to model in a, lab in a laboratory setting, because some of these changes are difficult to control for. And Sybil focuses specifically on osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, which both are really important in the current aging societies, and they present a major healthcare with the projected expansion of the elderly population. So as you can see, there's up to 40 million people who currently suffer from osteoarthritis in Europe and there's also a very high risk of osteoporotic fractures which is up to 50% in women and up to 30% in men currently. So they're really important diseases to study. What we also look at is rare skeletal conditions. So at the moment there are 450 of these identified and when you look at all of them as one group they actually have an overall incidence of 1 in 4,000 so they're not as rare if you, if you look at them as a whole group of rare diseases. But this extrapolates to 225,000 people in the EU. So it's quite a lot of people that are affected with these. These conditions affect growth and development of skeleton. They can affect cartilage, bone or cartilage and bone and other tissues sometimes as well. They are often monogenic, which makes them easy or easier to model in the lab situation. And they can be modeled in cells and in transgenic animals. 
and they often offer us a simple model to analyze the effects of single genetic defects in a disease progression. So they, they can actually <coughs> help us understand these as well. So what I wanted to do for the purpose of this meeting is to show you how the rare diseases can help us in understanding the common diseases and the disease we picked is osteoarthritis, so I don't need to really introduce it to this audience, but in the healthy joint, as you can see here, we've got this nice coating of cartilage over the femur and the tibia here. But in osteoarthritis, what happens well, during aging, your extracellular matrix here changes and remodels and thickens, changes the biomechanical properties, and then by micro-injury, you start having this degeneration of the cartilage, which then tries to repair itself <coughs> with the course of remodeling and degenerative uh, actions and that leads to the erosion of the cartilage and then you can start seeing the subchondral bone and also the bone is remodeling and growing these extra bits that it shouldn't grow. So basically this all leads to joint stiffness and pain and osteoarthritis. We can model this in animals and this is a histology image from the joint of a mouse. So the red stain is stain sulfated protein glycan so basically shows you where cartilage is located. So this is again tibia and femur, you can see the red, nice red staining in the healthy joint which shows the cartilage at the end of the joint. But in the mouse that develops osteoarthritis, that staining is completely lost and you just see the subchondral bone exposed. So as I said, osteoarthritis is very important to study because there are over 40 million people in Europe that currently suffer from it. It's a severe health burden in aging society with currently really no treatment available. It's a multifactorial disease which makes it difficult to model in a lab setting and it's often modeled in animals in the laboratory by inducing trauma or having surgery, surgical intervention in an animal which is not necessarily recapitulating what happens in real life. Uh, there are also spontaneous animal models of osteoarthritis such as some mouse breeds and guinea pig breeds but they're often not genetically tractable which means we can study, we can study them to look at disease progression and maybe try some treatments in them but we don't really know what's the genetics underlying the disease and we can't really breed them with other mouse models to dissect the molecular pathways in this disease. And this is where uh, rare skeletal diseases come in. Uh, so rare skeletal conditions can affect the development and growth of the skeleton. They're monogenic and easy to model, which I said before. But they're also often associated with other complications which are common, common diseases such as osteoarthritis. And one such disease is multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, which was actually featuring on Kelly's slide as well. And that's an autosomal dominant rare skeletal condition, which results in a severe form. It results in shortened dwarfism, as you can see in the individual here. But in a mild condition, the growth is really not affected. However, it's associated with joint laxity and early onset osteoarthritis. And this disease results from mutations in the structural proteins in cartilage. So basically you just have a point mutation in one of the proteins that builds the cartilage and this leads to all these complications. So when we look at the mice, at the joints from the mice with, this mu with a mutation leading to MED, what we start seeing is this organization in the matrix. Uh, so this is transmission electron microscopy image of a giant surface in quite a young mouse actually. And you can see in the mutant that the matrix organization is a lot more disorganized than in the wild type. It's you get thicker collagen fibrils and they're located all over the place. And what this does to the cells is, well, the cells start dying where they shouldn't be dying at the surface of a the joint. They also try to divide at the surface of a joint which where they shouldn't be dividing, so they're trying to compensate for the abnormal matrix. And we know that they are sensing it as well because they're forming these large protrusions into the matrix, probably trying to figure out what's going on and interact with it. So what was interesting is that these changes, we've seen them already at one week, so in quite young mice, and then when we looked at the older mice, this is 18 months of age in the mouse, then we see what I showed you before. So basically in the control mice, you still have a nice cartilage coating on both sides of the joint, but in the mutant mice, that's completely eroded and the subchondral bone is exposed. So what is interesting here is that this is, as I said, 18 months, so this, is, this correlates to about 50 years in human. So basically it means that these mice are developing an early onset osteoarthritis. But what's also really interesting is that we see those first changes, ultrastructural changes in electron microscopy at one week, then we see these at 18 months, but up to one year we don't really see anything. <coughs> so nothing happens for that period of time and then suddenly we start getting the cartilage erosion. So we're trying to figure out why that is. And we thought maybe it's just walking or some injury and trauma throughout the life, but we also started focusing on the other <coughs> tissue complications in osteoarthritis and in aging and these are soft tissue complications. So very often 
when you get away, you also, well, before you get away, you also get muscle weakness and problems with tendons. Sometimes it's a tendon injury, sometimes it's joint <coughs> laxity or joint stiffness. All these can destabilize the joints and then affect the progression of osteoarthritis. And some of the MEG patients are actually diagnosed with neuromuscular disorders, either with muscle weakness or joint laxity. And they often suffer from tendon and ligament <coughs> laxity. And we know that the compositions of the tendons is different. They often have thicker collision triples in the tendons. And we're actually collaborating with SEMA on that as well to try and figure out why that is. So <coughs> when we took a uh, tendon from one of these mice that developed osteoarthritis, and what we've done here is we tried to stretch it to a certain length for 10 <coughs> times and measure the force it takes to actually stretch it to that length. As you can see, the force required for stretching for 10 stretches in a wild type mouse pretty much stays the same. But in a mutant mice, you, you require less and less force to stretch the tendon, which means it's becoming more lax in the cycling. So what was also interesting is that the mouse models of the same disease that we have that have structural changes in cartilage but no joint laxity did not develop osteoarthritis. So in here we've got a model of a complex disease etiology and it helps us dissect the biomechanics of the progression of this disease in the relevant in vivo system. So in a way this, is, this reduces the complexity of just the osteoarthritis study because we know it's a single gene change and we've got the biomechanics of the, of the disease progression here now. What we can also do with these mice is we know that these cells are reacting differently to the different environment they're sitting in. So we can cross our mice with knockout mice for different uh, elements of signaling <coughs> pathways and figure out which are the pathways that are important for this sensing. So to come out of the detail and back into the larger picture again, <coughs> the specific interests are in the common conditions, as I said, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. And in the rare conditions, we're focusing on chondrodysplasias, which are the first five here, which affect the cartilage growth and development and also are associated with osteoarthritis, and bone disorders, which are the four, the four down here. So basically what we were doing is, across the 18 centers, we've got different models of these diseases, and we're trying to figure out the signaling pathways that are leading to these diseases and build a bigger picture of bone and cartilage biology. So this is where the buzzword of systems biology comes in. So basically what we're doing is you perform an experiment, it could be in your cell system, in the animal system, you can stimulate the cells to do something or just watch the aging progression, and then what we do is gather omics data. So basically we're trying to gather as large scale data as we can. So we're looking at the transcriptomics in the so gene expression throughout the tissue or in the cells and the changes in the proteomics as well. What we also do is interrogate what we found against the literature because, as I said at the beginning, there are open omics databases, so other consortiums that are working on similar projects are depositing their data there as well, and also some of the signaling pathways that are important in cartilage might be also important in other tissues, so we might learn from other research as well. Plus, well, people were doing research before the omics era, so it's good to go back and see what was actually figured out then. But then we use this data and our data to build these large networks of protein-to-protein -protein or gene interactions so we can try and see, we can start and build this, the full picture of what happens in a healthy and, and diseased cartilage or bone. And then once we know this, this will help us delineate mechanisms of the disease so we can lead from that on to diagnosis, find a new biomarkers for diagnosis, for example, and identify new treatment avenues. And uh, as you can see, the arrows on this graph are pointing in both directions because this is always an ongoing work and everything feeds back onto each other. So. So just to give you a flavor of, of what we can do, this image here is generated by the uh, University of Manchester, which are one of the collaborators on Sybil, and basically this shows you the interactome of articular cartilage. So every white nodule here is a protein that is involved, well, that the, is present in articular cartilage, and all the gray lines are de depicting the interactions between the proteins. So you, as you can see, it's a very complex image. This is a bioinformatics image, so we can zoom into it and actually identify the nodules in the centers, the proteins that are in the center of certain interactions. So this is starting to tell us what is actually binding to what in cartilage and what is important in the signaling cascades. Now another interesting thing on this image is the red dots. So the red dots depict the proteins that are either up or down regulated in osteoarthritis. And then the red lines are showing the interactions between them. So as you can see, you can start building the picture of what is actually important in the disease that we're studying, and that will help us then model, for example, if we change this, what, it, what would it impact on, and how we can then detect the changes, and maybe they would be beneficial or not. So this is what Sybil is all about. 
but also what is important is interacting with people who are actually affected with the diseases that we work on. And uh, for that we have a website, which is here, so if you would like to visit it, we actually populate it with a lot of information about the diseases that we work on and we keep current updates of what we're up to. We'll also be organizing workshops such as this one if anybody wants to come and participate, although I don't know the dates yet, but they will feature on there. We also tweet, if anybody wants to see a Twitter. And Professor Briggs has his own blog on which he uh, puts the information about the skeletal genetics research, which is specifically done in Newcastle, so if you want to visit that, that would be good as well. Um, I have a poster outside, so if you want to chat a bit more about Sybil, you're more than welcome to come and see me. And I also have a microscope with some se sections and samples, so if you want to do a little bit of hands-on science and learn a bit more about rare diseases, then you're more than welcome to come and see me later. Thank you very much.